Hey guys, Professor O'Kane here. It's become an increasingly rare occurrence when somebody does anything that is innovative on the electric guitar. I'm happy to say one of these occurrences has come to fruition right now. Ella Feingold is a Grammy Award winning guitarist that has the kind of resume you would just salivate over. She's played, performed and or recorded with Queen Latifah, Erica Badu, Janet Jackson, Corrine Bailey Ray, Jay-Z, John Legend, Bruno Mars and the list goes on and on. I truly believe when somebody creates a voice that did not exist before they did their work. It, it, they, they earn the title of genius because it rarely happens. Ella took the concept of an inverted tuning, which we'll talk about later on, and made it into something that is absolutely new. And you guys got to check it out. This is a great interview. If you look in the description below, you'll see Ella was kind enough to give us a link that basically has a starters kit in there for you for free. Ella is so well spoken and it was just a, a, a total education for me to interact with her. I hope you guys enjoy this interview. Please hit the subscribe button. It really does make a difference. Thanks. Ella, <laughs> how's it going? Good, how are you? I am doing great and you are so welcome here. I'm glad we finally got a chance to connect. Me too. Let's just go right into it. Um, when I first, I mean, I was scrolling to Instagram and the first thing I saw was inverted tuning. And I thought, uh, this is like another one of those Instagram, you know, quirky, weird things that don't really amount to anything. And then I heard it and I was like, what the F is this? Is this, this sounds really, really good. So first of all, is this your own invention? It is not my own invention. No, I definitely always want to give credit where credit is due. Um, so um, there's a guy who lives about an hour from me named Chris Weissman. Mm -hmm. um, and he invented it around maybe around like 2008. He's a really prolific singer songwriter. But as you can tell with the tuning comes up with all kinds of crazy tunings and just beautiful chromatic harmony just very colorful not your typical like cowboy chord singer songwriter and <clears throat> so basically um sorry my voice is a little scratchy today um basically i sort of had a a, a musical rebirth so to speak and i started to play upside down because I was inspired by my friend Jeffrey Lockhart, um, who's just a, an unbelievable funk guitar player. And I kind of had this dilemma because playing upside down and striking the high strings first and following through on the low strings had a very particular sound to me. And I could like, <clears throat> I could like never turn back to standard tuning. However, I'm 42 years old and I'm just like, man, I, I, I can't do my 10,000 hours again on a whole new thing. I mean, I was really kind of torn and like the timing was perfect because my friend Blake Mills hit me up. like l i love you know the funk stuff you're doing playing upside down have you ever checked out this, this tuning called inverted tuning so he introduced it to me because he's been working with chris and chris introduced it to him so i tried it and um i just took it and ran with it 
and never looked back. Um, and so that's sort of how it came about. I mean, it was sort of invented. I don't know why Chris invented it. I mean, I would imagine just he wanted some more colors. Um, I sort of repurposed it for funk and rhythm and stuff like that. But the more I like dove into the tuning, I was like, wait a minute, there's all kinds of crazy harmony that's just waiting to be excavated out of the tuning. So I'm like still, you know, finding stuff. I'm like, oh my, God. sorry, my cat is uh, right next to me. Um, you know, I'm just like, man, like you can do George Shearing voicings. Like, wow, is some Bill Evans harmony. Like, wow, I can get all those like neo soul kind of like, well, it all came from, you know, like um, Roy Ayers and that kind of acid jazz stuff. And so I'm, like every day I, I just am continually surprised. I see your cat um, by the um, by the gifts that the tuning gives you. And and it's funny because um, a couple of people did a, a, some videos on inverted tuning and my and I'm, I'm so thankful, um, was, you know, if it's OK to mention them, Rhett Scholl and RJ Ronquillo and um, I was really concerned that people would just think it's a gimmick, like you said, like it's just a, oh, it's just this thing. Some people would be like, oh, it's just like a Nashville kind of tuning thing. And it's just, yeah. and it's whatever you want it to be. I mean, if that's what you want it to be, it's like a little sort of gimmicky overdub it with standard tuning, then it's that. And if you want to make it your musical identity, then it, for me, that's what it is. What exactly is inverted tuning? <laughs> So I mean, I, know, I, you, I get it's you. upside down, but it's, it's upside down. What what kind of just makes people's brains explode is that it's the same exact tuning as standard tuning. It's E A D G B E, mm -hmm. okay. but it's high to low rather than low to high, um, and the middle two strings get inverted. So if you were to take a regular left-handed guitar and flip it upside down so that the orientation is high to low, it would be like E, B, G, D, A, E. Mm -hmm. And this is E, A, D, G. Now the D and the G stay the same orientation from standard. So if I just play it open. <laughs> Lovely. Even just open. Even just open, yeah, and just. Yeah, how difficult would that be to do that in standard? You know, to, yeah. those harmonics right there. So what? What about um, since you're dropping the B, and are are, are you sticking with the same string gauges? Like if you're using tens, are you? No, I'm not. It was definitely trial and error. Um, I definitely started with just regular tens because that's mm -hmm. typically more where I'm, I kind of live. Mm -hmm. um, and then, of course, I found that for respectively the B string, which is the A, you know, I found that um, it was too loose because it because the pitch is going from B down to A. So I needed more tension. And I found that respectively the A string, which is tuned to a B, was a little bit too tight because mm -hmm. it was going up. So I knew that I needed to compensate for these two strings. Mm -hmm. um, and also because I just really dig into the guitar when I play rhythm, <clears throat> excuse me, I just found that the high E string as a 10, especially from going where, where I'm coming down on it first, right? Mm -hmm. Rather than it being over here, um, that a 10 was just, it was, it was too loose and I just needed more tension. So for me, I change the strings around, but I just want to say it has nothing to do with tone. It's just for tension. So yeah. it's like a, it's a 10, a, a, sorry, let me start over. It's an 11, yeah. a 16, and then this would be what, a 32. 30 something, yeah. Yeah, 32, because that's the same. Um, I'm doing a 17 for the G. Now this is a 32 rather than what a 36 because I wasn't, yeah, it's 11, 16, 26, 17, 32, 46. I think that's going to be very helpful for people wanting to try this. Um, yeah. and, and it's an important thing that maybe um, is, is, easy, is easy to skip over. Well, I just want to say that, you know, you can absolutely use tens. I mean, you're not going to be 
you're not going to be playing these strings and, and like it's it's not going to throw you off guard. It was more just a fine tuning thing. A lot of people have started playing inverted tuning, which I'm really flattered. And, you know, um, a lot of people are using like 11 gauge, just the mm. full. I even tried, um, there was a time I tried um, the Pyramid Jimi Hendrix mm -hmm. set, which was sort of 10-ish, but the low E was a 38. Okay. Um, so I tried a lot of different things and I just sort of keep sticking to this gauge um, just because, because of the way that I, I play. And so are you full time on the inverted tuning? I so yeah, I'm full time on it. Like, I mean, this is how I play. However, if you like go to my Instagram, there's plenty of stuff in standard tuning just because I need to be able to relate to people. And especially if I'm teaching like a song that's in standard tuning. Right. If I got called to do a record, I mean, it's sort of like this. When I can play inverted, I'm always going to play inverted tuning. And when I have to play standard, I'll happily play standard. Um, how about soloing? Are you soloing is, it's hard because it's, um, well, single lines, are, I would say, are the most challenging thing with the tuning because, especially because, you know, it goes out of order. Mm -hmm. So like, just like a blues kind of scale with, I'm, I'm just going to play it with one finger so you can like see it, but you know, oh. so you got to go from here <laughs> to here. Yeah. You know what I mean? Rather than up here. So now I have to skip the G string and go up here to the D. But chords and yeah. rhythm, it's such a gift. So those that's that's obviously the advantages because some of the voicings that I heard that that actually I was like, oh, I need to contact Ella immediately, were the kind of thing that um, you know, if if you had a massive hands, you would even be pushing that to the limit to get this kind of sounds and the close intervals that you get playing those kind you of can parts. Play lines, you know. There's there's stuff there. It's it lends itself to a lot more um, angular kind of sound. So the more scalar, scalar, you know, stepwise things. Yeah, it's more challenging for sure, but mm -hmm. absolutely possible. I would say the gift, which some people may <clears throat> excuse me think is a hindrance is that it does force you to think more horizontally, you know, which will in turn get you to be more vocal, vocal-like, right. you know. Right, right, um, right. So it, it just depends. Some people look at it like, you know, I don't want to mess with this because of the single lines. I look at it like it's a challenge. The gift is the rhythm. The gift is the harmony. And the single line stuff to me is like it's, it's there. You know, I was talking to Charlie, my friend Charlie Hunter about it, and, and he tried playing inverted for a little while, um, and he sounds amazing on it. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he was just saying, if it were me, and I was learning the instrument from scratch, I'd be focusing, you know, on the D and the G string, which have the same orientation from standard, and trying to just play lines from those two, and just starting mm -hmm. there, and really yeah. exploiting those two strings. Great suggestion. And, and, you know, and then add in other ones. Because let's be honest, like when you listen to Charlie's record, like he's holding down the bass and he does so much with fourths and stuff like that, you know, mm, and yes. single lines. So, yeah. What are some of the um, really beautiful, dense cards that are your favorites to play? Um, stuff like, you know... you know um, minor two five 
lives. I'm not going <laughs> to <laughs> so there's, there's there's a lot of stuff, and I mean for me with rhythm, just being able to get all this, you know. Now, I'm gonna grab my guitar for a second. I, I wanted to the thing that you're doing. Wait, get here. This one thing that you're doing that I had never seen anybody else do that I somehow um, uh, started doing myself was doing doing with the left hand like this. Um, when did you start doing it? Because when I when I saw you do it, I was like, yes, somebody else is doing this. So. Um... Okay, so first of all, Tuck Andrus talks about this a lot, and he there's a clip of him even demonstrating it where he's like just going like that and, and just muting this to just show you what the technique is. Um, so I got this technique from my friend Jeffrey Lockhart, and you know, the way that Jeff sort of and, and we do the technique a little bit differently. Um, mm -hmm. You know, he does it to kind of keep all of the stuff that's happening in between very, very clean. Yeah. And sort of just jumping on and off of the notes that he needs. Yeah. Um, I took that and wanted to just do something different with it. So I just didn't sound like him. Right. So I kind of over exaggerate the jumping where I'm getting more, you know, that kind of stuff yeah. as opposed to like... Yeah, yeah, that's different. That's different. The, the, yeah, I'm really trying to. Yeah. yeah, I was doing the same thing. Like that. I, the same thing you're doing. And it's you know, great to see. You know, I mean, I couldn't say, like, where where did it come from originally? There's one song that um, that definitely has this technique. And I can't remember if it's Earth, Wind & Fire or the Ramsey Lewis, but it's Sun Goddess. And I think it's mm. something kind of like the. Yeah. You know, I'm, I'm kind of over exaggerating it, but it's mm. that kind of stuff. But yeah, it allows um, for more articulation to happen. It allows just for a, a to me, a more like staccatissimo, just a real clean. And you're messing with note duration, which is the the epitome of funk creation. Yeah, for me, I'm like, you know, I mean, I, I kind of have this whole spiel where like this is pitch percussion, it's a drum and it's not a guitar. And I mean, I do really feel that way. Um, but I'm always kind of trying to strive for that like trumpet like staccato where it's like almost like Morse code short, you know, right, right you know like as short as it can possibly be yeah so the jumping on or jumping off really allows for that tightness to happen but it's not just that i mean it's also the string action i mean look how ridiculously high my yeah that is yeah. you know so that allows me um means i have more resistance to push into the sound the guitar is fighting me i have to fight the guitar and this sort of goes into a longer thing, which, you know, we don't have to talk about, but a lot of us, I think, are taught to have the instrument be like, we we judge or value an instrument based on like how sonorous it is, right? Like we go to the music store, you plug in the guitar or you don't plug it in. You're like, man, this thing sustains like crazy, you know? Right, right. Um, and to add on to that, it's like, you know, what can I do to my instrument to make it comfortable for me to play? Oh, well, I prefer jumbo frets or eight gauge strings or like lower action, what, whatever it is, you know, um, you know, I, I want to bend the whammy bar so it's closer to my hand. It's yeah. too, you know, just like we, we constantly make these modifications. I, I throw all that shit out the window. And for me, I don't want the thing to be resonant. I don't want it to be sonorous. I mm. want it to be like a drum. I want this to be sort of off more than it is on. 
because I want to fight the instrument. And I find that with action that's incredibly, incredibly low, that there's not really any shading. It's like you're either literally, you know, the chord is literally on or it's like off. Yeah. And with high action, it's like, you know, I'm just going to go up the neck. I'm, I'm literally not pushing the sound at all. But yeah. you'll hear the pitch changes. You know, obviously, if I push in, but, you know, I can get the You know, I can push in as much as I want because I have resist resistance. And if I have really low action, it's it's like I'm fighting to keep my hand even lighter. Um, right. So, so yeah. That's um, I, I like how you said that you'd like it to be more off than on. I think that some people might hear that as you want your guitar to be like not working right. I don't, that's not what you mean. You mean that you you. You want the sound to be more off than on. Would well, that be it's right? like you go to a drum set, right? What kind of sound do you value? Do you want the most resonant, bright drum set? Right. Cool. Nothing wrong with that. I want tea towel drums. I want dark cymbals. I want smaller, you know, tuned jazz drums with tea towel drums. So that's kind of what I mean about off is that I get like, to me, this is tea towel. as opposed to So did we just did we just coin the tea towel sound on guitar? <laughs> I think that might have just happened. Give me some more I've of that tea towel. I never said that before but I was like trying to relate. You know what I mean? Cuz it's mm -hmm. like you could listen to that drum sound like a Ringo or whatever and be like that's wrong but they're going after a particular sound. They want a thud, they want a transient, they want an attack. And that's, I, I want this to be like some congas or some bongos or something mm. rather than what you know this for, which is who, whatever, right. Jimi Hendrix, Satriani, Steve Vai, you know, Joe right. Pass. I'm like conga drum. <laughs> um, but that's just my way. You know, it's not, it's not the right way. It's just, it's something that I am striving for in, in, in here. What? Yeah. What has been your connection to R and B and funk throughout your musical, your professional musical life? What has been your, what is your history with with that? Went to Berklee College of Music. Mm -hmm. uh, wasn't really working for me. Um, I just sort of didn't really know how to get anything out of the school. I ended up studying with uh, the late great Spanky Alford. Um, who played with D'Angelo and, you know, a Tribe Called Quest, Mighty Clouds of Joy, you know, all the neo-soul guitar players. He's, you know, neo-soul Jesus on the guitar. Oh. I'm an atheist, by the way. But anyways, um, sorry. Um, but I dropped out of college to, to study with him. And so he had a very unique style of, of fusing Joe Pass, Johnny Smith, quartet mm -hmm. music. Um, all of these things together. So I got back to Boston and he sat with me for a week. I dropped out of school to study with him. After I got back, I joined an all black, you know, African-American Pentecostal church that helped get my ear and my feel together. I started playing at Wally's Jazz Cafe in Boston, which is a famous jazz funk club. So I had all of these kinds of experiences I ended up getting a call to play for um, Queen Latifah in 2005. I was like 22, 23. So it was my first big tour. Mm. That tour was Queen Latifah, Jill Scott, Erica Badu, Flo oh, Atree, I think Mary J. Oh, Blige man. joined for some dates. So I ended up getting the Erica Badu gig, which was my longest running gig from the Queen Latifah. From Latifah, I ended up meeting Questlove and working with The Roots and Jay-Z and Kanye West, and Eric Benet and Corinne Bailey Ray and all these, all of these people um, had so many wonderful experiences. Most recently, I 
have a, um, if I can move my camera, I have like a Grammy certificate for my work um, with Silk Sonic with, with Bruno Mars and Anderson Peck. That's mm -hmm. for um, record of the year for Leave the Door Open, which I'm, you know, really proud of. And um, that's sort of my whole, you know, R&B spiel. Um, got to study with Wawa Watson, Phil Upchurch. You know, I, I, I really... I really did my homework on these men and really valued what they did and sought them out, you know, asked questions. And do you think that they're, that you're still going to continue to tour with these people and record with them? Um, I took a long break from touring because I, my, believe it or not, my main job is I'm an orchestrator for film and for video games. So that um, is mostly what I've been doing. I, I actually stopped playing guitar for five years. Um, so no, I mean, I, I would be, I've been getting a lot of um, really wonderful comments from teaching recently a lot on Instagram. And so it's definitely just, um, I don't know how to articulate it. It, it. It's just made me want to be a lot more visible as a guitar player and tour and relive a lot of these experiences that I did, you know, because I toured 10 years straight out of a suitcase, wow. you know, home for two days, going to Russia, home for a day, literally back to Russia the next day with a different artist. You know, it's just, it was, um, it's a, I'll say this, I would never tell anyone not to be a touring musician ever. Mm -hmm. But I promise you, whatever you think it is, it ain't that. <laughs> you must have some amazing stories. Yeah, I got to work with Prince. That was really cool. Um, yeah, some really, some really cool experiences, you know, very, just very grateful for all of the opportunities. And I feel like whatever it is that I offer today, it's like my, um, my experience you know, that I bring to the table more so than like, whatever it is, you know. So Ella, tell me something. Somebody takes a guitar, they flip it over, and they're just going to start playing with the inverted tuning. Where do they start? What should they start doing? Well, first of all, I can give you after the interview, I can give you a, a link because I made a PDF, of a sort of just a starter kit. Um, well, you know, the thing with inverted tuning is that I guess I didn't mention this. And so I guess this is important. The reason why a lot of people are taking to inverted tuning is that certain shapes that you play sound the same way. So if I play A major, that's the same exact shape, you know, and I've played a million times and it sounds like A major. So you don't have to relearn A major. Um, now things like sharp nine, it's familiar, but it's different. Right. That is quite literally the Hendrix chord, you know, but there's a lot of things where you have to make musical decisions. You know, is this viable for me as a sharp nine or do I want to rediscover it here, which is what the Hendrix chord is. So it's your call. Um, and I'm not saying that to be dismissive. It's like, there's not really a big primer. I mean, a lot of the voicings that you know do transfer. They just sort of, they just sound a little different, you know, because the overtone series sort of gets flipped on its head, right? You know, now a lot of your color tones are more at the bottom of your chord rather than up top. What does that mean in terms of strumming? How does that reverse it's whatever you want it to be like for for inverted tuning for me one of the things i love is constantly strumming up because i feel like i can get this beautiful harp like so i mean technically speaking that's a downstroke for people that play standard tuning, mm. but I kind of swipe diagonally. Yeah. So it's this really soft, it, it, to me, it sounds like a harpist, you know, doing a, a gliss or even doing like a fingernail gliss. Um, 
funk stuff, I mean, I, I guess I do prefer, you know, downstrokes, which mm -hmm. are upstrokes. You know, but I could easily do, I mean, well, check out, listen to the difference. I'm okay. just going to play D7. Nothing but downstrokes. Now I'm just going to play down and up. Sorry. Now upstrokes. You know? They all have like a different articulation. And I kind of just switch them up depending on, you know, what the music calls for. There's something that I noticed that you do quite a bit and you're recording yourself a lot. And I've seen that on Instagram and I'm wondering what does somebody like yourself who is an expert in your field, what are you listening for when you listen back to your own playing? Oh God, so much. <laughs> um, well, I'd say the first thing that comes to mind is timing. You know, I'm listening for, are my backbeats dead on? Now, obviously, if I'm practicing with a metronome, it, it's really bringing out the truth, right? Rather mm -hmm. than if, if I'm doing it without. But let's say I'm playing to a metronome. I'm listening to my backbeat. Am I dead on with the drum or whatever is happening? Am I a little ahead? Am I a little behind? I'm listening for all of the big moments, big moments meaning like not the ghost note, not the quiet in between kind of stuff, but just the big pillars, the big, you know, the big beats and all that stuff. When you were playing with Erica, what were you listening for in terms of where were you going to place your guitar on the beat? Oh, um, it would depend on the song. I mean, some stuff I would, if I had to give you a recipe, <laughs> I would say the backbeats always a little bit early, just a touch. Mm. Things like the kick, the one, the three, get that thing dead on the grid. Everything in between, which is technically a hi-hat, swing it and have it be a little bit late. So it's almost like everything is perfectly, imperfectly quantized, so to speak. Obviously we're humans, there's give and take, but having your backbeats a hair early and having the kick on those two things sort of keep you marching in line and when your hi-hat or you know whatever this is really kind of swung and late mm -hmm. it, it that's where like there's this push and pull that happens but if everything's early it's no no good if everything's late it's no good if everything's too swung then it's a little more like new jack swing right. so it's it's like this push and pull so when i listen back to myself i'm i'm listening for you know the big beats i'm listening for the in between stuff um so in between stuff meaning like let's say i take um like soul power or something right so if i don't play anything other than the notes, it would be this. So in between meaning you know, all those little moments, these little, you can sort of look at those as ghost notes, mm -hmm. um, like on the snare. So it's like, you know, those ghost notes, are they too subtle? Am I bringing them out too much? That's too much, you know, so I'm, I'm always listening like a, like a drummer, you know, listening to the ghost notes, listening to the big beats. Um, so I'd say rhythmically speaking, it's that I'm listening to how much sound am I letting like bleed in from the chord? Mm -hmm. uh, meaning like this. I mean, that's practically off, right? Right, right. But this is all on. Which is just not funky. So, yeah. so this is fully on. But the in-between isn't. It's just the in-between, you know.
So it's like there's something strong and dead on, there's something swung and more choked. So it's, it's, it's like, it's like um, my whole motto for rhythm is like complex, but not complicated. Okay, uh, so you, you made it through the neo soul era with playing for the biggest possible names of that time. Can you help me figure out what in God's name is going on with today's neo soul where this there it's like, okay, there's behind the beat. And then there's like, they want to be all like in the front of the beat that just happened. Do you know what I mean? It sounds so to me, it sounds like it just sounds like a character of like music that was actually soulful. I'm going to say something. It's going to anger a lot of people. That's uh, okay. Not, That's what this channel is for. <laughs> I'm not saying this to put anyone down because at the end of the day, if doing all of these things brings you joy, please keep doing them. Don't, don't listen to my opinion. Um, first of all, Neo soul, all the guys and musicians I work for, they hate that word. <laughs> it's just soul music. It's just funk. It's just R and B, but that's right. what it got branded as. Right. And that's what we all know. I, and I, I use the word too. Um, but it was about a feel. And like I explained, that feel was more subtle. The, the snare was a little early. The high hats were swung. So if you're going, t -t -t -t, it would be swung, but all of the ands. So the, t -t -t -t, that would be a little bit late and swung, but the, t -t -t -t, that would be pushed even further late. And then anything that was big beat, like one, three stuff was dead on, but any of the boom, those kinds of things would be late. So everything like the bouncing ball, everything perfectly fit in. It just got stretched apart. However, it was more subtle. And so with the feel, it went from like, um, like, um, let's say from this, you know, um, like, uh, like D'Angelo, right? That's D'Angelo's thing, but a lot of neo soul cats today would be like, you know, or just something that would be simple, funky, like, they'd be like, It's just, it becomes yes. a caricature of what it is. And, and all of this comes from Jay Dilla, the late producer. And the way Jay Dilla programmed his drums is exactly what I gave you, the recipe. Everything's quantized, but it's in perfect place. It's, it's, it's perfectly, imperfectly quantized. Um, so if the snare's early, it's always early in the same place. Now, now, that's not to say he didn't unquantize certain things and do things freehand, but there was a funkiness to it. It was always funk, simple, complex, complex, but not complicated. So a lot of the rhythm now, it just kind of became a portrait, a caricature yeah. of what the feel actually is. And then musically speaking, and again, I'm not trying to like... But hang on a second. Hang on a second, Ella. It not only became a character, now it is hip yeah it's what's, hip. what's weird guess. for me is like i'm a 42 year old woman i've been playing neo soul professionally since 2001 2002 you know and touring and all that when that music was you know doing its thing Wait. now it, it's gotten a rebirth and what's crazy for me is like i'll have people be like yo you played guitar on the erica badu soul stage like i learned all those parts in college you know and i now i'm like the old the old wise musician you know um even though i still feel young but what i want to say about this music is this it's supposed to feel good it's supposed to hit you in your chest. It's supposed to make you move your hips. It's supposed to feel like sex. It's supposed to be foreplay. It's, 
it's supposed to swing a little bit. And I hear a lot of guitar players, and this is what I'm going to say that's going to piss people off, and I'm sorry. It's a lot of shredders with unbelievable technical facility that learn some minor nine and minor 11 chords and are approaching it from a shredder aspect. Now, that can be a beautiful thing because it's birthing a whole new sound and I'm not shitting on that at all. But to make something feel good and funky, it's just way too much technical facility. It's too expensive sounding. It's too polite. It's too clean. There's and it would get you fired immediately off of a and it'll get you, <laughs> And it'll get you fired. That's a whole nother thing. So a lot of cats that I hear, it, it's just... It sounds like a shredder that just, you know, you know, yep. shredding and, and, and it, but with minor nines and 11s and it's like, it's cute. It's cool to listen to for like a 60 second reel, but like, you ain't never working playing that shit. <laughs> it's not. So again, I'm not trying to turn up, say, don't do that if it brings you joy, but it's just, that's not what that music was. That's not why that music was birthed. This is somewhat a product of playing in your bedroom and not playing live. Yeah, you know, I mean, think about, so I'm not a jazz musician, but think about sitting in your bedroom and just shedding jazz improvisation for hours, mm -hmm. whatever, 26 to Giant Steps, Holdsworth stuff, whatever. When you finally get into an ensemble experience after years of playing alone, it's kind of like showing up to a party and being like, hi everyone, how you doing? Ah, and just like talking and saying all this stuff and that yeah. there isn't like with quartet, like string quartet, like where there isn't a conversation and listening and responding because you're so used to playing alone and not with other musicians. And the whole Instagram stuff, it's a beautiful thing to connect people and be visible and be inspired by things but back to the neo soul thing i mean that stuff was all about a feeling you know and so when i hear a lot of the stuff now it's like the i'm gonna piss people off again get, I'm a white yes, go ahead and get them angry get them angry. I'm, a white, I'm a white woman and i play black american music so let's let's make that clear what a lot of people have done is taken and put their white hands on the neo soul music and made it into a caricature of what it was by whitewashing it and and making it way into this technically you know kind of impressive thing and that's not what it was like what impressed you back then was the harmony was the feel was the rub was like making yeah. that stank face like that is what was impressive you know it wasn't the chops of it. It was just the, the, the feel, you know, when you listen to Erica Badu, Badu's, um, I don't know, on and on, you know, it's just two chords, you know, but it just, like, oh, it just feels so good. So to take those two things away and like start reharming it like crazy and, you know, moving the time all around, um, it's just that feeling's gone now, you know, yeah. and again, it's okay if it's something different, but it's not neo soul because it's, it's been whitewashed. It's, it's been, you know, the, the, the soul is gone. It's, it's like jazz and then smooth jazz or whatever. And it's not saying smooth jazz is bad. It's just, it's not what it started as, as jazz. Right. So it's not a, it's not a matter of like, this isn't good. And this is good. It's just like, this isn't this. <laughs> Well, the reason we can why just acknowledge I, these things aren't the same. Then right. it's cool. Well, the, I was going to say the reason why I brought this up is, I mean, somebody might, if hopefully people are still watching, <laughs> um, they might be saying, what in God's name does this have to do with inverted tuning? My point is that it, all of your experiences inform what you're doing now. So I think it's, hearing you talk and express yourself like this is um it gives us an insight to what is behind it it's not just you that picked up a guitar and flipped it upside down and then came up with this thing you know the the you know playing funk guitar in inverted tuning it's that you had this massive these massive experiences behind you 
in farming all of that. And I think that that's pretty poignant. I mean, I care so much about the feeling of music, how it makes you feel, that I literally made my life harder by flipping this upside down. But when I go like this, it sounds like different. Diff, 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 diff. It sounds like a DJ scratching. Yeah. I can't get that sound in standard tuning. So I made my musical life more complicated because I like the way that this sounds and I'm not willing to go back because this feels, you know, better to me. And that's, well, how, you... that's how dedicated I am to making things feel good. You know, somebody said once, and I, you know, it may be like a live, laugh, love kind of, you know, cheesy Hallmark quote. But somebody said, people will never remember what you said to them, but they will always remember how you made them feel. Right. And I really feel like with rhythm, it's the same thing. They're going to remember how you made them feel that night and on that record. They may not remember your licks. And I sort of look at it with like, and I'm, I'm not trying to come across as like, oh, this bitch just plays rhythm and she can't solo. So she's just shitting on anybody that can't, that solos. It's, it's not that. It's like, I kind of look at it like, do you want to impress someone or do you want to make someone feel something? Right. You know? um, and I just feel like with rhythm, people feel it. That doesn't mean that you can't play single notes and be funky or solo and have someone feel something. But I... I, I guess maybe a better way to articulate it is I feel like a lot of the stuff that I'm hearing now, it's they want to impress you rather than make you feel something. Of course. And they only have X amount of seconds to do it, um, you know, because yeah, we're in Instagram, TikTok world, you know. It's a challenge for me. I mean, I teach some stuff and I've got 90 seconds to talk to you about single note funk playing in the style of Wawa Watson in 90 seconds. I mean, it's, it's, it's challenging, you know. Um, well, I think one thing that's super important and I think is a really great place to end is um, you, your music makes, I, I think I'm almost positive that everybody's listening to the way you play, especially on, on Instagram videos. Your music makes us feel good. Certainly makes me feel good. And I think that that's a real, that's, it's a real plus you're focused on it and i can tell you as an experienced listener i can feel it the way you communicate what's going on musically in technical terms is a, is very refreshing to hear and i'm certain that that comes off really well in your teaching the way that i try and teach it it came about from honestly kind of having some unkind teachers and having some oh, people yeah. sort of shame me and not my mentors, not Spanky Alfred, not Wawa, you know, not not cats that I really learned from. But there were a lot of angry musicians that went to school and then tried to go out in the world and didn't meet whatever goals that they had set for themselves and then came back into the institution and started regurgitating what it was that they learned that didn't work for them. Mm -hmm. So unfortunately, I bared the, the brunt of a lot of like musical abuse of people making me feel bad for not knowing things. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, obviously we have to work at our craft, right? I mean, it is a craft, like there's no way other than through it, but you shouldn't be, you know, feeling horrible about yourself while you're trying to learn how to walk, you know? And so it's it's kind of like, you know, as a baby learns and they fall and you get up and you get encouraged. I just want to come from that approach. I don't want to like yell at a baby because they fell down. And, and I had kind of like musical experiences like that with with people. Um, so I just want to put love out into the world, even though I kind of went on my little spiel about Neo Soul. Like I'm. I, no, that's I, good. I, that, they I, don't have to apologize for that at all. That was. I just really, um, I just, I just want to reach people. I, I want them to feel the energy and the excitement that I have, even if it has nothing to do with what they do musically. I just want them to be excited, you know, about, about music and, and, and to be musically generous and, and give back. And, and it comes from there. It comes from having 
some bad experiences, right? I mean, isn't that sort of, you meet someone that's so un unbelievably kind and then you kind of hear an unfortunate story of what led them to have so much empathy and, and love yeah. and kindness. Well, I think, I think you're doing it the right way and uh, really, really enjoy not only talking with you now, but also listening to you play. And um, I'm going to have to get a guitar and, you know, <laughs> and give this a go. Yeah. <laughs> all right. Uh, all the best to you. Thanks a million. Thank and um, so we're going to definitely keep in touch.